uh, most Muslims don't practice these things, but it is based on Islamic law. That's simple. Mark on WABC, you want to comment? Please go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. Thank you. Uh, I just found it very interesting when I read the 15 uh, laws that it's somewhat similar to the laws that can be found in the uh, Bible. Not of course, exactly. I've covered that before, right? It's found in the Old Testament in Leviticus. And so what is your point? Do you know any Jews who practice slavery with young girls? <laughs> My point is that, you know, as an I'm an Orthodox Jew, I have friends that are very... Uh, no, I get I understand that. Some of these insane rules are in the Old Testament. I get that. They're sickening. But they're based upon your ancestors' practices, not yours. Isn't that correct? Correct. So what I want to know is since they hate Jews so much and they hate Christians so much, why are they utilizing the whole menstrual cycle? These are common oh, oh, okay. I hear what you say. In other words, if they hate Jews, why do they take most of their laws from Judaism, from the original t Bible? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, you'll have to ask them. You'll have to ask them why they took it from the Jews. Then they want to kill the Jews. What, is it? what more do you need to know about them, about these fundamentalist Muslims? It's really sad. It's sad. Would you like me to go into details on why we're getting this insanity in the world now? Would you like me to talk about inbreeding and what it does? Because I've covered this on an entire show. Do you know how many members of ISIS are the results of genetic inbreeding? In other words, they're morons. Do you get that? Yes. Yes. In I other words, the lowest, the lowest IQ found in the entire Islamic world is attracted by ISIS. Because of inbreeding, marrying cousins, for example, you do know there's a high degree of cousin marriage uh, in that uh, community. Are you aware of that? Correct. I'm uh, helping. All right. Well, I know an awful lot about it. It's been studied in great detail. The inbreeding that is rampant in some of the primitive Muslim communities produces mental defectives who join ISIS. And you got to remember that Hitler used mental defectives to work in his concentration camps, by the way. I don't know if that answers any questions or opens up new ones. Join the Savage Nation. Call now. 855-400-SAVAGE. 855-400-7287. Savage. Beverly Thrills, California, on a remote location. I don't know how much longer I'll stay here. Cost me a fortune to build a studio. I'm ready to go home already. What's the point of traveling? Nothing works right. Is the sound good? I hear the sound is good, except when I yell, it's a little over, over, overly loud. We can't control my, uh, my uh, actual emotional reactions to these things, which get me so crazy. I don't know how much more of it I can take. I want to wake up one day, and I want to see them dead. I want to wake up, I want to see ISIS bodies littering the desert. I want to see them screaming like schoolgirls as special forces run in and real men run in to take them on instead of the girls that they're kidnapping and raping. I mean, I really want America back. I want it back so badly, but I'm not going to get it back. Not now, not for a, lo not for a while yet. Oh, no. No, no, no. The, the, the thin smoker is uh, snorkeling in Hawaii right now and climbing Cocoa Head Crater like he's cr climbing Mount Everest. Make him believe he's on a real hike. Imagine he climbed Cocoa Head Crater, which a schoolgirl could climb. With one foot, she could hop up the Cocoa Head. He made it look like he high, uh, hiked up a cliff. This is better than Al Gore with the canoe. Okay, what's this? I can't even read it. Line four, Tom V something, whatever. It's not coming up on the screen. Tom, what's on your mind today? Uh, Dr. Savage, I think every time we talk about ISIS or the, uh, the Muslim refugee crisis, or our traitorous politicians like Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell. We also need to talk about George Soros and the Zionists that are pulling everybody. Oh, hold, hold it. Well, you know, you know, I'm the biggest critic of George Soros in the world. Now, why are you jumping to Zionist? Well, where does George Soros and Zionist come into the same sentence? Uh, well, the the Kalergi plan, and I'm sure you, I'm sure. Well, you're, you're. In other words, look, I know you're a white, I know you're a white Jew hating racist from somewhere in in the deep south. I get that, but to link George Soros with all Jews is insanity. Uh, well, what about Bibi Netanyahu? Uh, kind of steering. He's a great man. He's one of the greatest Jewish leaders of all time. What about him? What do you want him to do? Roll over and turn his children into slaves for the Muslims? We're just talking about Muslim sex slaves. What do you want, Bibi Netanyahu to roll over to, to Hezbollah and say, take our girls? 
Well, BB Netanyahu's got. If we had a BB Netanyahu running America, we wouldn't have the problems we have. He is running America. Okay, so in your in your sick mind, Zionists are the problem for everything, including ISIS. You're so demented that you think ISIS are Jews now. Pal, I'm a I'm a, a veteran with an honorable discharge, and a, I really don't and, care if you have a silver star and a green star in the Medal of Honor. You're still a racist. No, 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 pal. You're blaming no. Jews for everything because it's in your DNA. You're racist in your DNA. So for you, wherever you turn, you pick up a rock and you see a worm, you say the Zionists put the worm there. You're, they don't control the media. Who's they? The Zionists. BB Netanyahu. When he now, BB Netanyahu controls the American media. The sentence. Say so you won't let me finish the sentence, pal. Oh, you can't finish a sentence because you don't have the brain power for it. You've been talking to your racist Ku Klux Klan friends for so long you can't finish four words and make sense out of it. Who would let you talk any longer than me? You just made an idiotic statement. You said B.B. Netanyahu controls the Zionists, controls George Soros. You're lumping everyone together. What is your main point, Tom? My main point is when Donald Trump said we needed a temporary stay on Muslim refugees, B.B. Netanyahu piled on him as well as everybody else. So, wait a minute, sir, I, I don't know what B.B. Netanyahu has to do with that statement. I, I don't get it. Are you implying B.B. Netanyahu controls Donald Trump now? Scheduled. Trump had a visit scheduled, and B.B. Netanyahu nixed it after Trump made his Muslim statement about a temporary stay. So that proves now in your mind that the Jews control everything? Uh, it's not that simple. It's not that blatant. Tom, you're, a, you're a, a war hero, you say. You never met a Jewish person that you liked. Have you ever met a Jewish person that was decent? Did a... I did business uh, with uh, a fellow, I'm not going to say his name, over the air for 10 years. A guy, he's passed away now, but we got along great. Okay, <laughs> did, you ever go to a, did you ever go to a Jewish doctor who removed a pimple from you and did it well? I don't, I don't know that uh, I've ever been to a Jewish doctor. So what's, what's your sol solution, Tom, to throw the Jews out of America? Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> no, but I think what we need to oh, do... Oh, no but. So what's the but got there? You just said no but. So what is your final solution? Our, my final solution, I, and I know what you mean by that. My final. I'm solution, sorry, I didn't know you were that well read. I mean, amongst the books on your table, I'm sure there's the Holy Bible and Mein Kampf. And I go right to the answer, and you, you won't. And listen. probably the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and uh, maybe a few books by a few of your other friends that I haven't seen yet. Well, what's on your reading table for tonight? What magazines do you read? I but bought your book to support the, the modern stormtrooper. How to cleanse your white sheets after a burn-in. I mean, what else do you uh, read? Sanitizing your sheets for the holy days? I, I can't imagine what he would have on his... What, what, what magazines does he get delivered to his doorstep in a plain brown wrapper? Sanitizing your sheets for a burn-in. I thought that was funny. Removing soot from your white sheets after burning a cross outside a synagogue. That would be, that'd be a, fresh, a fresh magazine. Uh, the, the smaller, the short version. All right, we get the picture. So, you see, here's the problem. When hate rears its ugly head in a nation, as it is right now because of what Obama has done to this country, everyone has someone to blame. In some cases, there's a rational connection to that blame. In other cases, there's no connection to the blame. But it doesn't stop people from bringing up their favorite hate objects. Do you understand this? So you've got black professors now saying all whites... Look at this article. Black professor, so-called, uh, says uh, all white Americans need to admit to the racist poison inside of you. And, of course, the idiots at the New York Times publish it and call him a philosophy professor. George Yancey is about the equivalent of, uh, you know, in my mind, in my day, a guy like this, uh, believe me, wouldn't have been a philosophy professor, George Yancey. I can't imagine what job he might have held, but it wouldn't have been philosophy professor, I can guarantee you. In fact, if it wasn't a family show, and I wasn't afraid of uh, ramifications, I tell you what, George Yancey, black philosophy professor, the most he could have achieved in my day, I'd like to tell you what it would have been. But I can't right now on the, sh on the Savage Nation. I, uh, I kind of respect my position too much. Okay, WABC New York, Andrew, go ahead. You're on the Savage Nation. What's your point and what's the topic? It's the uh, black professor speaking of racism. 
that professor does more damage to the black community than any racist could. His policy. Well, wait, but so does Obama. That's what they want to do. They want to stir up the black community. They need more Fergusons. They need more Baltimores, don't they? You know, because you were a former social worker in the inner city, you see the single moms and you see the government dependency that Obama and the, the leftist policies. Holder supports letting crack dealers in the black communities back out on the streets earlier. He said the laws were racist because the white cocaine dealers. Yeah, yeah, I heard that lie, right, right. The same powder is a little heavier and denser, and therefore it's racism. I've heard that for years. So release, co relief, release crack dealers. Let me tell you something. I know black people told me that crack destroyed the black inner city community. It went through it like the Grim Reaper. It destroyed the entire inner city community. Crack was the worst thing that ever hit the, the inner city black community in this country. Do you know that? I remember in the mid to late 80s, it was devastating and Holder and Obama and the black professor, they're not going to live in the housing projects with the single moms and the crack dealers. So they're actually a detriment to the black community. Well, by the way, you know, you raised an interesting question that occurred to me the other night. I tried to do the math. When were the crack babies an epidemic? When was there an epidemic of births amongst crack mothers in this country? Was it in the mid-80s? Mid-late 80s, mid to late 80s. Okay, so let's say mid eight, late eighties. Let's uh, let, so let's say nineteen eighty five. We're now twenty fifteen. So that would make some of the crack babies who are still alive. How old are they? Thirty. Uh, right, mid thirties. Thirty. They're about thirty years old. The ex crack, the the surviving crack babies. Where are they today? Where are those people who survived the crack epidemic, who were born to crackhead mothers? Where are they? I mean, where are they working? Or that's a good working? question. Where are they? Where would they, where would they be today? In rehabs or they're in jail some of them are dead some hopefully turn their lives around that's what i hope for and i support the you black mean they're not all they're not all on uh, uh neurosurgeons like uh haven't all become neurosurgical professors not not obama and this per this professor definitely not but i support the black community that's why i fight against these liberals that harm them thank you dr savage all right. Well, this man remembered that I actually was a social worker for many years. He's one of the few listeners who knows the history of the man behind the voice. I am the only person in the major media who actually worked at so many important professions where I actually know reality. I don't just read you know, some websites. I was a social worker on the Upper West Side of New York. I can tell you some stories one day, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe another day. What I learned, it started to turn me from being a um, I, I would say a, a wild-eyed, progressive, liberal kind of kid. My father hated me for it. He thought I was insane, which I was. It was temporary insanity. I went to Queens College. My brain was being washed by commie professors who fled Europe. I came here, and the first thing he did was brainwash us. I came up with ideas that my father wanted to throw me through a window for what I was saying. He knew I was crazy. It was a temporary insanity. But I, I thought he was wrong for being so harsh. And he would say to me, don't worry about it, you'll learn one day. You'll find out what your, uh, what your ideas will bring you. I can hear him to this day. I can hear him to this day. But you know, in many ways, we're still our fathers, no matter what we think. We, we, are, no, we are our fathers. We're our fathers. No matter how we try to not be our fathers, we become our fathers. Do you know that? That's something I want to talk about one day. For men only, which is not a political thing. It's maybe a psychological thing. Let's say you had a, a father you didn't like because he was too harsh on you. Well, let's say you had a father you didn't like because he was too weak. I mean, there's two, let's take two types. The weak father and the overly strong father. So the overly strong, chastising father usually produces a son who's a rebel who says, I'm not going to let him get to me. I'm going to be stronger than he thinks uh, I am. And he becomes strong like his father. And then he becomes just like his father to his own children. Even though, he, even though he said he wouldn't, he becomes, in essence, his father, who's overbearing on his own children. Then you have the weakling father, where the mother wears, wears the pants in the family, as we used to say before the gender insanity infected America's uh, psyche. And the weak father usually produces a rebellious son as well. And you remember the movie Rebel Without a Cause with the James Dean, the great movie, even if you've never, you didn't have to live through that time period. It was so well staged where the Sal, uh, no, the, uh, the character played by James Dean came from a home in Los Angeles, middle class. The father wore an apron in one of the scenes. He was doing the dishes. 
And James Dean used to plead with his father to be a man. All he wanted was his father to be a man, not a, not a kind of a weakling kind of guy. His father was sweet and nice. 